Good morning, church. We, this morning, will be in Psalm 126 in our continuation in the Song of Ascents, Songs of Ascents, from the book of Psalms, Psalm 126. Let me read this for us together. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Sheaves being a bundle of wheat tied together that the farmer carries out of the field in the harvest. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, we look forward to what you have for us today. We are in eager anticipation. Father, we pray that we would be attentive and that your word would go out to everyone here and that we would understand it, accept it, and put it, take it to heart. Father, you are so good that you restore our fortunes. We thank you for that. And as we go through this psalm, we just pray that you would encourage us and convict us, us as we need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are continuing through the Songs of Ascents. That's 15 psalms in the latter part of the book of Psalms. These are songs that were sung by the pilgrims of, of Israel. All the peoples were called to Jerusalem uh, during annual feasts in the year. They all came up and climbed to Jerusalem. Now, oftentimes when you're climbing a mountain, your, uh, your, your view is affected by trees and ledges and rocks and all of that. But on occasion, you will come to a switchback and a high point where the view just stretches out for miles and this psalm is a lot like this because it shows us such a grand vision of, what, of God's ways with men and women. I'm going to preach this psalm with three major points. The first being, what joy God has redeemed his people. Number two, no unbroken joy in a broken world. And three, sorrow transformed to joy as God works within us. So the first point, what joy God has redeemed his people. The psalm starts, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. To understand this psalm, we'll spend some time to dig a little bit more deeply into the catastrophe that the people of God had experienced. What's the historical background of this psalm? It seems pretty general. Literally, verse 1 says, when the Lord turned back, those who were turning back to Zion. Uh, many older translations will say, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion. And I'm convinced that this is the case, that the Lord here is bringing back the people from the Babylonian exile. And that exile, um, after the destruction of their country, was the greatest disaster that the nation of Israel had ever gone through. And it caused them, uh, it was caused by them, it was a self-caused disaster. And it was the greatest example of God restoring his people since the exodus that we have just read about. So this was the return of the captives to their land um, and their city, Zion, from the Babylonian captivity. So this is called the exile of the nation of Israel. For most people familiar with the Old Testament, the exile is a historical event. It's like a line on a timeline, but we've really got to understand what the exile really meant to the people of God. It was heartbreaking and appalling and really apocalyptic. It was kind of like a nuclear strike hitting the cities of the Pacific Northwest, and the few survivors were transported to a far-off country like Northwest Uzbekistan to work on cotton fields forever. Jerusalem was destroyed, burnt, and rubbleized. It ended the kingdom 
of Israel. The temple was demolished, which ended worship and sacrifice there. The nation of Judah, which was independently operated and governed for 500 years, right in the middle of the earth, it was wrecked. God called the nation of Babylon to deal with his chosen and called nation and then to take them captive. Kind of an ancient form of ethnic cleansing where an emperor would take a problem people, take them out of their land with a view that they would lose their distinctives and change forever. So this was the utter collapse of all of their hopes. In various Psalms, we see historically the strong trust of Israel in their God, like Psalm 46, speaking of Jerusalem. God is within her. She shall not fail. God will help her at break of day. You see, they had long given up their faith in God. They traded him for something that they thought was better. So why did God do this? He used the nation of Babylon, more sinful than his own nation, to demonstrate his justice and punish them. God requires that the people made in, in his image display his righteousness, and he will always judge. So this was the sequence for Israel. From the start, they had a stubborn streak and a wandering eye, rebellious heart. God rebuked, corrected, and helped them, and even made a covenant of, with them to give them a land of their own, as we are reading in the book of Exodus. And he did an amazing work, delivering them from Egypt and from the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, but they quickly hardened their own hearts. There was never an untarnished golden age of Israel. In his providence, God continued to give them kings and prophets to lead them back. In spite of this, Israel fell into massive and gross idolatry. They worshipped the stars, creeping things, and fell for the wicked idols of the nations around them, which in the ideology of the days would give them prosperity, peace, possessions, and pleasure. He even copied the practices of the Canaanites who lived in the land before them to do dreadful things like even sacrificing their own progeny. They traded God. God spoke through Jeremiah to them. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. So God sent prophet after prophet to his nation. And then he finally said, it is over. Now, when a cancer patient has a tumor growing out of control, the doctors will examine what sort of a tumor it is and will prescribe a drug, often, that is a powerful poison that will kill the tumor. The side effect is that it almost kills the patient. So this is what God did to Israel. He administered moral and spiritual chemotherapy against gross idolatry, 70 years in a foreign country. Now, why did God bring his people back? Certainly to fulfill his word in prophecy and to show them mercy. But there's so much more. Did you know that in 500 years after the return from Babylon, which is just a blink of an eye in heaven's time, God was coming in person to purify and refine his people, not just in Israel, but from every tribe and tongue. Malachi 3 says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. God was coming in the person of his only begotten Son. In Galatians 4, the Apostle Paul writes about this. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. It was required that this son be born under the law so he could fulfill it. Without the return, there would have, uh, without the exile, that is, this paganizing nation would have completely forgotten the law. Without the return, there would have been no temple for him to return to, no sacrifices that would point to him. 
and without the exile and the return, how would there have been even a faithful remnant in the land, which would include someone like the Virgin Mary who said, I am the Lord's servant. So this passage from Galatians reveals God's overall plan. God sent his son 500 years after the return from Babylon, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because he fulfilled the law, he buys sinners back from captivity and our own self-made disasters. And in him, we receive adoption as sons and daughters of God, who will know him and enjoy him forever. This is why he judged his people and then brought them back. And when you read the whole Bible, understand that its entire narrative and story is about this continuing, continual work of God throughout all history, leading to one Israelite king who will rule the nations. You know who this one Israelite king is who will rule the nations? There is only one. And through his cross and resurrection and ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he makes sons and daughters of God right here in this room to this very day. So this is why the Lord brought his captives out of Egypt. He brings them out of captivity under the Persian Empire, which took over for Babylon. Consider the response of the people of God and just look at the images of here, the images right here. It says, we were like those who dream. And when tragedy strikes us hard, it seems like a bad dream, doesn't it? Have you ever faced a catastrophe in your life, even one that you've been the cause of, and there seemed to be no way out? These people living through the return from the exile, which is described in Ezra and Nehemiah, they had an all-expense-paid trip back to the Holy Land. They simply were having to pinch themselves to see, to see if this was real. Have you ever had a dream that was so good, you were actually disappointed when you woke up? Then it says, their mouth was filled with laughter and our tongues with shouts of joy. You think that being a Christian is no laughing matter? Certainly, there are a lot of dangers outside and, of course, within us. And we make decisions of eternal importance, matters of life and death. But this psalm says that laughing was their response to a great deliverance. Why do we laugh? It's usually when we hear something really unexpected and great. Like, for example, we're going to have a baby. Captives were going back to see Zion again, the city of the great king, even after their grandparents had been deported 70 years in the past. And this laughter coming from their mouth, though, was not frivolous. They knew the height from which they had fallen and their, that, that their heart was desperately sick. But God had overruled the consequences of what they had done. What a glorious surprise. Their tongues were full of shouts of joy. Verse 2 continues. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. God works in these amazing circumstances, almost like a counter catastrophe, so that no one can question who it is that did it. He wants all the glory because he deserves it. And it is best for us when we ascribe all the glory to him. God used the Persian king Cyrus to bring his people back. There's a proverb, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. That proverb was true then, and it's still true today. But God turned the heart of the mightiest emperor on planet Earth, and all of the Gentile nations around were dumbfounded. They simply were compelled to ascribe glory to God. These pagan nations had no love for Israel. But they could not deny that this God, who was in covenant with Israel, had done great things. So the returning Israelites hear this statement spoken by Gentile nations, but to them it meant something deeper even. They knew that height that they had descended from and their rabid lust for idol worship and how they rightfully deserve the just and right and frightful judgment of their God. 
Gentile nations didn't appreciate that, but now in God, in his mercy, had remembered his covenant once again. So they say, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. So not only is God's name renowned and respected by the nations, even among the people of God, there is reverence and rejoicing. So what a joy. God redeems his people from their self-made disasters. Friends, have we experienced the grace of God in this kind of a way that leads us to shouts of joy and laughter? Thank you. Our society trains us to be cool. Sometimes we're too afraid of what people think. And not all, all of us are so exuberant. But this is about joyful shouts like hallelujah. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. I'm going to go to point two. No unbroken joy in a broken world. The psalm takes a turn here. Now the people are facing new difficulties and they turn to God. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. The Negev being a dry land desert in the south of Israel. So were they still living the dream? Here's the reality. There will be no unbroken joy on this broken earth until Christ comes. And may he come soon. Though miraculous sa miraculously saved and deeply loved, God's people continued to experience an impossible level of desperation in a hard life. So we don't have the historical background given to us here, what they were facing. This is a universal experience. They were in the desert, just sand and rocks. So the psalmist is saying, there's no water and it's impossible for there to be any life. And this just creates in him a desperate longing for God to do again what he did before. Psalm 42 says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord, or my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Why did they experience this? Well, we're the same. Even though we have all been gloriously delivered by God in the past from disasters of our own making, and in ways that strike us internally, it's just incredible that we shout for joy. These emotions fade, don't they? I'll make what I think is a 100% prediction. As a Christian, you will lose your sense of joy. Now, many of us in King's Cross here are new to this church. Um, that often means an exciting new discovery of what God is speaking to us and working in our life, new insights into his great glory. But we're all going to have to travel this desert. Why does every saint experience this? Well, first, this world is still fundamentally fallen. It will continue to oppress us and frustrate us and seek to undermine us, undermine us. We read in Ezra and Nehemiah how the people faced a lot of difficulties in rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. Secondly, our own continuing sin. The post-exilic prophets like Haggai and Malachi um, really decried the people and their moral downgrade. It was not as absolutely wicked as in the past, but they really had sinful attitudes and practices, stinginess before God, contempt for his worship, and rampant divorce even among the people. So in our own lives, our own assurance of salvation is rocked by our own sin and our shortcomings, isn't it? That's why we have to confess and pray, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me, and restore to me the joy of of your salvation. The third reason we still go through this, and this is really the most important, it's from our Father's most affectionate love for his children. It's for our discipline and our good. The Lord instructs us in a certain kind of school, doesn't he? You know what that school is called? Hard knocks. Yeah. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
It's not the same as circumstantial driven happiness. It's always in the Christian to some measure, but we've got to cultivate it and fight for it. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So while we know that God has done remarkable things for us in the past, we just can't camp there. We can't go back there. We say, restore our fortunes, O Lord, and please do it again, like streams in the desert. So we can base our future hopes, even in the middle of impossible situations, on what God has done in the past. The final point, God works within us to exchange sorrow to joy. After the prayer, the psalm goes in a completely new direction. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. So God will answer in a most improbable way. When we sow and spread and plant seed in such a waterless desert, and through the instrument, indeed, of our own actions. Let's look at sowing. So sowing is a labor. It takes work, and it's an investment. Investments were not invented on Wall Street, by the way. Putting seed on rocky soil would lead to a hungry wintertime. And the amount of the harvest is uncertain. It depends on many contingent things that we just can't control. And of course, the result takes a lot of time, which means waiting. And of course, uh, this psalm does say that the Lord restores, but he employs our steady efforts as we sow to achieve that. And it's a hard slog. It says it takes sweat and tears. In the eyes of much of the modern world, a sorrow is considered purposeless and almost irrational. Tears are considered embarrassing. Have you ever seen a TV advertisement that showed suffering? This is how the sowing takes place. Suffering is so universal that every philosophy and religion attempts to explain it somehow. People do their best to avoid it, to dull the pain, and even to de deny it exists. Here we read this proverb, those who sow in tears will reap with joy. But when? When will we reap? And how long do we have to wait? Well, we need to consider how our Lord Jesus read this psalm. You know, this book was his songbook, and it was his daily meditation. From Psalm 1, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, to Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This was in his heart. He knew this verse. So the psalm continues by, consider, by considering a lone farmer in verse 6. And you can see Christ here. Listen to this. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Now we respect a man that works very hard. We respect a woman that works very hard. But no one ever worked as hard as Jesus of Nazareth. He perfectly performed all the commandments of God from the heart. He said in John chapter 5, My father is working until now, and I am working. He took after his father. From a young age, he said he had to be about his father's business. And that was to do the works that he saw his father doing. So it says, he went out weeping. Christ left his heavenly home where he shared the glory with his, own, with his father as the only begotten son and came to our sin-ravaged world of weeping for the glory of his father and for the sake of our salvation. The Apostle Paul writes that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He wept with those who wept. So it says, he went out weeping, carrying seed to sow. Now, as he approached his most painful work, Jesus said something remarkable about how he was going to do it. In John chapter 12, he says, 
The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a seed falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He compared himself to a seed. If it stays in the bag, nothing happens. But if it falls to the earth and dies, it can yield 30, 60, and 100 fold. Our passage said that he was carrying seed to sow. He carried that heavy cross through the streets of Jerusalem and gave himself to die on it. If it dies, it bears much fruit. He died a true human death. He died before an unjust judge. He died as an innocent sacrifice. But here's the thing. He was glorified in his death because his death accomplished something that no one in a million years or in a million worlds could ever accomplish. The very Son of God died in our place, in the place of suffering sinners who hear this message, believe it, and put all their hope in it. He died, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. The innocent lamb received in himself the judgment incurred by the sins of his people. And by doing this, the seed that died would yield an amazing harvest. And what fruit was brought forth? First, a couple of hundred disciples, then thousands of people in Jerusalem in the book of Acts, then throughout all Judea and Samaria, and now to the ends of the earth. Let me ask you again. Do you know of any man who said, compared himself to a seed and then died and then produced millions of followers over 2,000 years? There is only one man who did that. And if you don't believe in him, I just urge you to rethink and receive him. There's none other like him. Death had no power over him. He rose by the power of an instrument destructible life to destroy the works of the devil and to take away the fear of death. There's an ancient prophecy in the book of Genesis chapter 3 where it says, the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. So Christ made an open display and a disgrace of the devil by triumphing over him in the cross. So this man went out weeping, carrying seed. It says he will return home with all of his sheaves. The Lord of the harvest promised to go back and make a home for us. All of us who are purchased by his blood. And he will come again and take all of us, pure sheaves, to be home with him in songs of joy. So this is how God saves it's really the story of all stories. God, at the last minute, saves from a self-caused disaster. And he does it like this, so it's unmistakable that all the credit, all the honor goes to him alone. So by way of application, as his people, God calls us to a life of sowing as well. It's the vocation of every Christian. As Christ did this for us, we must be formed into, the, in, into his image as well. It's an amazing fact when you think about it that God calls us to imitate him. When we look at the work of our almighty Savior, our efforts, I would say they're less than puny. Nevertheless, he calls, we must also sow. That means we have to invest our life in the work of God. In the, we need to spend our money, spend our time, this meaning spending ourselves for our Lord with the view of bearing fruit for him. We're to be busy like Christ was in our father's business, putting our talents to work for him, always looking forward to the harvest that only he can deliver. Now, in applying this passage, I'd like you to take you to Galatians chapter 6, to the Apostle Paul's teaching. If you could turn there, it's Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. In regards to sowing and reaping, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, 
that will he also reap. Now, you know, when the Apostle Paul says, do not be deceived, that means a lot of people are being deceived, and it's a temptation for us to be deceived. Paul is telling the Galatians that there are many people who doubt this very simple agriculture law. For whatever one sows, that one will also reap. It seems so obvious, doesn't it? If you sow nothing, you'll reap nothing. If you sow tomatoes, you'll reap tomatoes. But it's also a spiritual law. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So There's just something desperately sick in the human soul that can't understand that very simple statement. For as one sows, one shall reap. Someone can invest his hours and days, which turn into months and years, into things that the human flesh just so greedily desires. And our sinful human nature will just uh, lust after so many different things that will lead us to this level of corruption. How many lives around us are spent in seeking the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? Sowing to the flesh seems so natural, but it reaps corruption. As the book of James says, when sin is full grown, it leads to death. So we need, we need to take this spiritual law very seriously, brothers and sisters, and take a look at our own investment portfolio, one might say. What are we investing in? This law really drives us to our knees when you think about it. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. So let's consider where we're sowing. If a farmer invested his seed on rocky soil, his family might not make it. So if we sow something like anger, do you think that we're going to reap friendship? If we sow lust, do you think that we're going to reap real, lasting pleasure? If we sow pride, do you think that we're going to gain respect from others? So sowing has to be to the Spirit. That's to do what the Spirit desires and to what the Spirit empowers us to do. Are we investing our time consistently with the people, in the people of God to build up the body of Christ, in the Word of God, communing with God in prayer for others? in evangelism and sharing the word with others? Or do we turn to the flesh, even to things that may not be sinful, but are just not what the Spirit desires? There are sins of omission where we fail to do what the Spirit of God desires us to do. Perhaps some have thought about just burying the talent you have and not putting it to work at all. So let's look at this with eyes wide open and let's not be deceived. If you try to push against this law, it just won't budge. So if if you and I, and I definitely submit that I am open to this, uh, (laughs) I I am very convicted by this passage. If we're just despairing of ourselves, we must look to the Savior. If you've wrecked it, the Holy Spirit can fix it. If you've sold it, Christ Jesus can redeem it back. And if you've wasted it, even, like a prodigal son, the Father can restore it. This psalm shows how he restores his people from self-made disasters. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So trust in him and just throw yourself on the Christ who did it all for us. He fulfilled the law, doing everything written in it. He spent himself and therefore he's qualified to free all who call on him. 
You see, we are absolutely saved by works. His works, his alone, his works will free us. Only from him can we find a cure from our deadly, our deadly self-centeredness and receive a robe of righteousness. So thank God that he's still restoring our fortunes like streams in the desert. And let us pray that those clouds would gather over the desert and those dry beds would just start coursing, would, would start coursing with living water fl flowing through us. Let's pray. Father, your word says, sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up your hard and unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. You sustain us, Father, in our tears and strengthen us for doing our work. Father, we pray that we would not grow weary in doing good. Help us and restore us, restore the things that we need. We ask you, even in a dry and weary land, restore those things. You preserve, you guard us, Lord. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. And Father, we ask that you speed us on our journey to the heavenly Jerusalem, where we will live in unbroken joy with you forever. In the name of our faithful Jesus, we pray. Amen.